Good afternoon. My name is Scott Pratt. I'm a philosophy professor in the department here at the University of Oregon. And I would like to welcome you to this keynote address by Professor Richard J. Bernstein, entitled Listening and Responding to Levinas. Professor Bernstein's address will be followed by a question and answer period. Uh, for those of you who would like to ask Professor Bernstein a question, um, use the cards that you find on your seats. Uh, just write the question down and then pass it to one of the aisles and runners will pick them up at the end of the address and bring them up to the front. Professor Bernstein comes to us from the New School for Social Research in New York. He is perhaps best known for his wide-ranging investigations of ethics, social thought, and the philosophy of science. He is also well known for his efforts to renew the American philosophical tradition and its connections with continental and contemporary analytic philosophy. At the center of his work has been a commitment to finding ways to bridge traditions so that philosophy can become a way to learn and understand across differences. Indeed, according to Professor Richard Bernstein, issues of the issue of identity and difference, or the one and the many, is one of the oldest and most persistent questions in Western philosophy. In a way, Professor Bernstein's work, whether discussing the development of scientific theory or reflecting on present moral problems, can be seen as an attempt to better understand human action in a world characterized by difference. Professor Bernstein is the author of a number of books, including the in, An Introduction to the Life and Thought of John Dewey, Praxis and Action, Contemporary Philosophies of Human Activity, Beyond Objectivism and Relativism, Science, Hermeneutics, and Praxis, Philosophical Profiles, Essays in a Pragmatic Mode, and The New Constellation, The Ethical Political Horizons of Modernity, Postmodernity. His most recent book, Hannah Arendt and the Jewish Question, will be released next month by the MIT Press. Please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Bernstein. Uh, I thank you for that <coughs> generous introduction. <clears throat> and before I begin, I would like to say three things. Uh, the first is Levinas talks a great deal about substitution and about how we can substitute and cannot substitute. I really feel that I'm here, not quite out of default, but I'm here because uh, Stephen Moses, who was supposed to be here, uh, was unable to come. It seemed to me in a discussion in which we're talking a good deal about ethics, uh, it's of some note that one of the reasons that he felt he couldn't come is that he thought that the t times in Jerusalem, in light of recent uh, events, were so trying that he didn't want to leave. The second thing I want to say is that I uh, originally thought it was impossible for me to come when I was asked, uh, uh, but I've always thought of myself as a teacher. I think what's most impressed me about this conference is how much the students participated and organized it. And uh, when uh, Stephen Stern simply wouldn't take no, I said, look, I can't do it. I've got all these other papers. I'm chairing a department. I'm writing, good, directing dissertations and MA thesis. And uh, when I heard in his voice the call of the other, I had a response. And the third point I wanted to make is that I appreciate the fact that it was such a demanding recall. I have, I, I'm a, I think I could imagine to say it, a closet Levinasian. Um, and I have never given a lecture entirely dedicated to Levinas. I consider this a tremendous challenge. And I'm glad that Stephen and the others who invited me forced me to face up to my response and responsibilities. Ethics after the Holocaust. The very title of this conference can make one tremble and elicit a sense of humility. A serious grappling with this title provokes a series of reflections 
that really can take us in endless directions. And yet I believe if we are to listen and respond to Levinas, then we must begin by thinking about the meaning of the very title of this conference. Perhaps it is really intended just to raise questions. In what sense, if any, is there ethics after the Holocaust? And how are we to understand after? Is the show us something that happened and is now over? Or is it rather something that defies temporality and will always be with us? Just as Adorno compelled us to ask in what sense there can be poetry after Auschwitz, are we meant to ask in what sense can there be ethics after the rupture of the Shoah? And there's also, as it's come out in some of the other talks, an oscillating ambiguity in the very idea of ethics. For we use the expression to refer both to the actual behavior and actions of human beings and to the reflective discipline in which we seek to understand and justify these actions. When I first heard this title, I immediately thought of a passage from Hannah Arendt who was born in the same year as Emmanuel Levinas. For in the introduction to her posthumous The Life of the Mind, when she reflects on the problem of evil in our time, she makes the following provocative remark, which I believe Levinas himself might have also made. She writes, the fact that we usually treat matters of good and evil and clauses of morals and ethics may indicate how little we know about them. For morals comes from mores and ethics from ethos, the Latin word being associated with rules of behavior, whereas the Greek is derived from habitat, like our habits. Now, Hannah Arendt is referring to a long tradition in philosophy where we associate ethics and morals with rules of behavior and cultivated habits. She tells us only habits and customs can be taught. And we know all too well the alarming speed with which they can be unlearned and forgotten when new circumstances demand a change in manners and patterns of behavior. It is perfectly clear what Arendt has in mind, for as she tells us in another place. And just as the law of civilized countries assumes that the voice of conscience tells everybody, thou shalt not kill, even though man's natural desires and inclinations may at times be murderous, so the law in Hitler's land demanded that the voice of conscience tell everybody, thou shalt kill. Although the organizers of the massacres knew full well that murder is against the normal desires and inclinations of most people. Evil in the Third Reich had lost the quality by which most people recognize it, the quality of temptation. Many Germans and many Nazis probably an overwhelming majority of them, must have been tempted not to murder, not to rob, not to let their neighbors go off to their doom. For that Jews were transported to their doom, they knew, of course, even though many of them may not have known the gruesome details. And not to become accomplices in all these crimes by benefiting from them. And then she ends that statement with a bitter, ironical comment, but God knows they had learned how to resist temptation. There's another set of reflections that set, was set off by the title of this conference that I think will bring us into closer proximity to Levinas himself. Think for a moment of the narratives that we tell about what has happened to the philosophical disciplines 
of ethics and morals in the last two centuries. The great defender of the very idea that morality does have a firm foundation was Kant. And there's something magnificent about what Kant sought to achieve, to demonstrate what we are as human beings, that as human beings we're autonomous, that we have intrinsic dignity, that our freedom consists in the capacity of self-legislation, that we are responsible for our actions, and that morality is not a sham but can be transcendentally grounded in our practical reason. And yet, ever since Kant, there has been a growing skepticism and questioning of this noble edifice. The jolting opening sentence, I remind you, of totality and infinity is, quote, everyone will readily agree that it is of the highest importance to know whether we are duped by morality. Whether we tell the story of the last two centuries from Kant to the present as one in which Nietzsche and Heidegger are key figures, or we give prominence to positivist and motivist strands in philosophy which trivialize ethics, philosophical ethics has become a marginal discipline, something almost of an intellectual embarrassment. We seem to be plagued by an endless variety of forms of skepticism, nihilism, and relativism playing themselves out in all their variations. So at a time when questions of good and evil seem more urgent than ever, when we turn to our philosophers and religious thinkers for some guidance and illumination, we find, I believe if we're completely honest, that much of what they have to tell us appears to be feeble and irrelevant. It is in this situation where questions concerning good and evil are so urgent and so many standard intellectual responses to them strike us as weak and irrelevant that the striking but elusive thinking of Levinas comes alive for us. Why is it that Levinas, who for so long was a marginal figure, even in phenomenological circles, and who was barely even known as a Jewish thinker, and still is in many circles, has especially in the last decade become so widely discussed and of so much concern? I believe the answer is simple and direct. It is because Levinas is the one, very, one of the very few thinkers before even one understands what he says, one can sense, one can feel that this is a thinker who is struggling with the deepest issues of ethics and responsibility. Levinas, like the Jewish thinker that he so admired, Franz Rosenzweig, is a self-consciously difficult thinker. I do not mean that he deliberately sets out to obscure or to mystify, but that rather that Levinas knows all too well that in our desire to understand and to comprehend, we can confuse what is said with the saying, that we smooth out what seems to disrupt and offend. Any close reader, I believe, of Levinas cannot help being perplexed and frustrated over and over again. But there's an opposite danger. The danger that as Levinas becomes familiar, almost fashionable, we will lose our sense of just how disconcerting and at times shocking a thinker he is. Fortunately, there is a growing body of excellent secondary sources, and many of the leading Levinasian scholars are at this conference, many of whom I've learned from, who have, can help in the hermeneutical task of understanding what Levinas is saying and why. But this afternoon, I want to do something different. I want to try to evoke for you the sense of deep questions 
and disquietude. Why he's such a disconcerting thinker that one experiences in listening and responding to Bevanos. How he lures us, even seduces us, with some of his provocative claims and gestures, and yet resists and disturbs us with the sheer strangeness and otherness of what he's saying. Let me begin with a claim that to a philosopher seems perverse and outrageous when we think of it against the tradition of Western philosophy. The claim that we think of ethics as first philosophy, or to use the language of totality and infinity, Levinas tells us that, and I quote him, metaphysics precedes ontology where ontology is taken to mean a reduction of the other to the same by the interposition of a middle and neutral term that ensures the comprehension of being. This is what Levinas calls ontological imperialism. Unlike ontology, where alterity is reabsorbed into my own identity, he tells us the metaphysical desire tends towards something else entirely, toward the absolutely other. The absolutely other is the other, say autri, which can never be assimilated into totality. It is what Levinas calls the stranger, and over him I have no power. Now why do I say these claims seem perverse and outrageous? Because if we think of the main tradition of Western philosophy, no one before Levinas draws a distinction between metaphysics and ontology in the way in which he does. Metaphysics and ontology have been considered to be the sciences of being, of what is. This is what Levinas following Rosenzweig calls philosophy from Ionia to Jena, from Parmenides to Hegel, and Levinas claims that in this respect, Heidegger himself belongs to the same tradition. Just as Rosenzweig felt the deep need to move away from the neighborhood of Hegel without, I would maintain, totally repudiating Hegel, and Hermann Cohn before him felt the need to move away from Kant without, I think, totally repudiating Kant, so Levinas felt the need to move away from the neighborhood of Husserl and Heidegger, although he always generously acknowledges his philosophical debts. All three, Cohn, Rosenzweig, and Levinas, in very different ways, have a sense that there's something missing in the philosophical tradition that nurtured them. And the name that Levinas uses to signify what is missing, what is beyond being, and beyond even thought, is ethics. Not only in ancient philosophy, but also in modern philosophy, ethics as a philosophical discipline has been considered secondary, based on some more fundamental ontological claims, on more basic principles, on some foundational arche. And even those philosophers who are skeptical of the very possibility of ontology still harbor the prejudice that ethics is a derivative discipline. To claim, as Levinas does, that ethics as first philosophy is to challenge, to, and I put this in quotes, to violently challenge and reverse what has been taken as a standard philosophical platitude. I place violence in scare quotes because Levinas is making the more radical claim that there's something inherently violent about ontology itself. When Levinas speaks of ontological imperialism, where the primary ontological drive is to reduce the other to the same, when he tells us that the drive towards totality is a manifestation of power is by very essence murderous of the other, he is not being merely hyperbolic or employing dead metaphors. Rather, he is suggesting 
that there is something at the very core of the drive towards totality, which he takes to be the essence of ontology, that cannot ultimately tolerate the otherness of the other, that finds it an abomination, that in the need to comprehend, to grasp, to contain, to master, we colonize and murder the otherness that we confront. The other that we can affront affronts us. And like the Lord in Hegel's master and slave dialectic, we assert our freedom by seeking to master it. We might say, to use a Derridian turn of phrase, one which itself is indebted to Levinas, that the logic at work in ontology is the drive, the drive, in the drive towards totality is the same logic that we find at work in the more overtly political forms of imperialism and colonialization. Now this is certainly not the typical way in which philosophers have thought about ontology. And one may be tempted to reject out of hand what seems to be preposterous claims. And yet, Levinas' exaggerated claims may give us pause to reflect, to recognize just how deep and pervasive are those patterns of thinking and acting which cannot really tolerate or accept what is authentically different, what doesn't fit our familiar categories, what is stubbornly and persistently other. I think what is so disturbing and per, uh, about Levinas's claims is that this logic is at work not only in commonly recognized overt acts of violence, that's easy to recognize, but also in those subtle gestures where we think of ourselves as open and magnanimous, as really open to the other, as long as the other is really just like us. But what does ethics mean for Levinas when he tells us that ethics is first philosophy? We normally think of ethics as dealing with moral principles, with norms, with duties, with rights, with values, with the virtues that rule or ought to rule human behavior. But as I think you know from even the other talks, this is not Levinas's primary concern. Indeed, he even declares that in this sense, he has never written in ethics. So once again, we may be really put off or suspect that Levinas of using the expression ethics in an idiosyncratic and arbitrary way. It is indeed idiosyncratic, but not arbitrary. The focus of what he means by ethics is always my distinctive relation to the other that cannot be assimilated or mastered. In claiming that ethics is first philosophy, he is pointing to something more radical, more originary than what we normally call ethics. For unless we recognize the ways in which we are infinitely responsible for and obligated to the other, then there can be no ethics or to use a more traditional language according to Levinas, our ethical duties always and necessarily exceed our rights. Now one may be tempted to say that Levinas's real concern is with the very possibility of ethics. That would be a philosophical way of putting the point. Except that this way of putting it makes it sound as if his endeavor is a theoretical transcendental project. But he is attempting to articulate something that is beyond our distinction between theoria and praxis. I think we come closer to Levinas's meaning when we say that ethics as first philosophy is really beyond philosophy, at least when philosophy is understood as ontology. And this is why Levinas is drawn to Plato's claim in the Republic that the good is beyond being 
and yet it is that which is presupposed by being. Still, our sense of perplexity and uneasiness may only increase in this way of speaking about ethics. There seems to be something extraordinarily paradoxical in the way that Levinas keeps returning over and over again to the discourse about the other, the absolute other, ex the exteriority of the other, the otherwise than being. For these terms seem so abstract, so typical of philosophical discourse. And yet, as we shall soon see, these expressions are intended to signify what is most concrete, what is most singular, and as Diane Perpich said, as most particular. What is so singular and unique that it never is comprehended in our conceptual knowledge. But before turning to this paradox, I want to deal with another one that is intimately related to it. This concerns the question of Greek and Jew. Greek as the metonymy for the tradition of Western philosophy and Jew as the metonymy for the Torah and the tradition of the sages. A superficial reading, or so I would argue, of Levinas can lead us to think that this stark binary opposition and some, that this is a stark binary, and some of his rhetorical constructions might tempt us to think that this is the way he thinks. And yet Levinas, as I read him, is always undermining or deconstructing this primary opposition. This is why I agree with those who emphasize that Levinas is a philosopher who tries to widen the philosophical horizon with the wisdom gleaned from the Jewish tradition. But I also agree with those who claim that Levinas should be read as a Jewish thinker who interprets this tradition using the language of so-called Greek philosophy. I think Derrida captures what I think is quintessential about Levinas when he concludes his famous homage to Levinas, and I read it as an homage to Levinas, Jew, Greek, is Greek, Jew, extremes meet. Now from a philosophical perspective, what makes Levinas, I think, so fascinating and appealing is his sensitivity to those moments in philosophy when it breaks away from ontology and totality and gestures toward an infinity and transcendence that cannot be totalized. There's something that is otherwise than being and beyond essence. And we can see from his famous Talmudic readings that his understanding of Ju the Jewish tradition is itself also informed by his sensitivity to and a translation into the language of the philosophers. It is this yoking together of Greek Jew that is the source, I think, of the power of Levinas's thinking. Let me explain. I said earlier that there is something prima facie very abstract about the discourse of same, alterity, other, even when we distinguish between the generic other, lotre, from the personal and human other, lotri. There's also a danger that these terms are becoming empty signifiers, a new jargon. Everybody's concerned with the other, and the other become, loses all its concreteness. But when Levinas, for example, declares infinity is characteristic of a transcendental being is transcendent, the infinite is absolutely other, we are on the familiar discourse of abstract philosophy. But when Levinas goes on to declare that to think the infinite, the transcendent, the stranger, is hence not an object, we are jolted. How does the stranger fit into the sequence? Or when Levinas declares the way in which the other presents himself, exceeding the idea of the other in me, we here name the face, we may be taken aback. For how do we make this transition from the other to the face, the face to face? What sense are we to make of claims that seem to link 
the most abstract of philosophical terms and the most vivid and concrete discourse. What is Levinas saying when he declares, and I quote him, the infinity stronger than murder already resists us in his face, in his face is a primordial expression, is the first word, you shall not commit murder. The infinite paralyzes power by its infinite resistance to murder, which firm and insurmountable gleams in the face of the other in the total nudity of defenseless eyes, in the nudity of absolute openness to the transcendent. A passage like this seems to be what philosophers call a category mistake a joining of what cannot legitimately be joined together. Our initial reaction, I think if we're honest, if we don't take them too smoothly, may be one of utter confusion. And yet, even before we understand what he is saying, we can sense, we can almost feel in this way of speaking, this yoking together of the abstract and generic with the most concrete and singular has a strange and powerful force. It helps to texture what he means by ethics. Levinas is not just making a theoretical claim that we must be wary of the philosophical ontological tendency to assimilate the other to the same, or warning us against thinking that there is nothing beyond being. He wants to shock us into the realization that when we face other human beings, there is always a temptation and a danger that we will violate their absolute otherness and singularity. It may seem extreme to call this murder, but if we think of murder as the annihilation of what is unique about the other person that we encounter, then we can begin to appreciate the power of this exaggerated mode of expression. But one might feel that this talk of the other, the infinite, of desire with a capital D, a language so foreign to the Torah and the sages, seems inappropriate to say what Levinas wants to say. But listen carefully as he links this with our description of our relation to the other. While the object is integrated into the identity of the same, the other manifests itself by an absolute resistance in its defenseless eyes. The solipsistic anxiety of consciousness seeing itself in all its adventures as captivated by itself ends here. The privilege of the other in relation to the I or moral consciousness is the very opening to exteriority, which is also the opening to highness. Does Levinas literally mean that when I look into the defenseless eyes of the other, I am aware of her absolute resistance, that I see the command, thou shalt not murder? I think the answer is yes and no. Of course there is a sense in which I can look into the eyes, literally, of the other and still murder. But listen again carefully to what Levinas goes on to say. The epiphany of that which can present itself so directly, outwardly, and eminently is face. The expressing of the face is language. The other is the first intelligible but the infinite in the face does not appear as a representation. It brings into question my freedom, which is discovered to be murderous and usurpatory. But this discovery is not a derivation of self-knowledge. It is heteronomy through and through. In front of the face, I always demand more of them myself. The more I respond to it, the more the demand grows. Yes, I think Levinas say, would say, I do confront absolute resistance of the other when I look into her defenseless eyes. No, he would say, what I experience cannot literally be seen. I see, in quotes, what cannot be seen, the infinite in the face. I see, in quotes, 
but can only speak to me. I encounter the infinite in the nudity of the defenseless eyes that I see. The epiphany of the face is the ethical, he tells us. Infinity presents itself as a face in the ethical resistance that paralyzes my powers and from the depths of defenseless eyes rises firm and absolute in its nudity and destitution. At this point, again, I think if we're honest, our heads may be spinning. This is the language of extreme paradox, a language of seeing which is no seeing, of faces which are not faces, of encounters with what cannot be encountered, inexhaustible infinity. Levinas tells us the face of the other at each moment destroys and overflows the plastic image it leaves me. Consequently, despite its visual associations, the face is not founded on any finite visual perception. The ethical encounter of the face-to-face -face is a summons to hear the other's call to me. As Levinas tells us, the face is the other who asked me not to let him die alone. Levinas goes even further for the ethical encounter is not just hearing the summons of the other, it also manifests itself in touch. It is touch that restores the intimacy and proximity of the self and the other. And Edith Wishagrod notes that for Levinas, and I quote her, that touch is not a sense at all. It's in fact a metaphor for the impingement of the world as a whole upon subjectivity. To touch is to comport oneself not in opposition to the given, but in proximity with it. Again, I think if we're honest, there's a thin line here between the language of extreme paradox and sheer nonsense. Levinas himself, I think, is profoundly aware of this. The paradox of trying to represent what is unrepresentable of saying what cannot be said. And yet, again, I believe that even before we make sense of what he's saying, we can almost feel what Levinas is saying when he tells us that in the nudity of the defenseless eyes of the face that we encounter, we hear the ethical summons of what is in such close proximity to us, and yet is also infinitely other than us. I do not think that we should ever forget that what it always was standing before Levinas's face is the Shoah. The dedication, the first one, of the other, to otherwise in being or beyond essence might have served as an epigraph for almost all his writing. This is what he has to say. To the memory of those who were closest among the six million assassinated by the National Socialists, and the millions on millions of all confessions and all nations, victims of the same hatred of the other man, the same anti-Semitism. I think this dedication captures both the specificity of the show and the universal thrust in Levinas's thinking when he speaks of all those victims of the same hatred of the other man. Levinas, I think, has a profound understanding of the logic that begins with a failure to recognize the uniqueness and singularity of the other, moves towards hatred, and culminates in murder and extermination. And as recent events remind us, this is not something which is past and done with, but an ever-present danger and possibility. The deepest ethical impulse in Levinas, I believe, is to expose and oppose this hatred of the other in all its varieties. Still, we may think that we can acknowledge what Levinas is saying, 
but insists that there are the resources in the traditional understandings of ethics and morals to make the same point. After all, if human beings really lived by the categorical imperative and treated other human beings as autonomous free beings, as ends in themselves, then they would recognize that this is an absolute duty not to murder, literally or metaphorically the other. But Levinas tells us that we have an absolute responsibility for the other. And it is <clears throat> by virtue of the other that we are responsible, that our relation to the other is asymmetrical and non-reciprocal. Furthermore, responsibility is not identical with or mutually dependent on our freedom, but is prior to our freedom. Every one of these claims challenges deeply accepted truths in the history of philosophy. Here, too, I think if we have to understand just how disconcerting I think Eleven are serious. We have to, in order to do that, we have to appreciate what is being challenged and why. Thinkers from Kant through Hegel to Habermas have stressed that morality at once presupposes and seeks to concretely achieve authentic mutual recognition, reciprocity and symmetry and mutuality. We should not denigrate or caricature this tradition. I think that's important, and I don't think that Levinas does. There is something noble about Kant's idea that each of us is an autonomous being, capable of self-legislation as an end in itself, and deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. There is something inspiring about the Hegelian claim that the dynamic telos of history is the concrete realization of freedom in which there is authentic mutual recognition of each other. There is an important truth in Habermas's understanding of a discourse ethics in which we reciprocally confront each other in a symmetrical relation and can mutually test claims to normative validity. We should not forget that all these doctrines contribute to a normative vision whereby we strive to eliminate unequal power, relationships, oppression, and distortive communication. We do a grave injustice to this tradition if we think of reciprocity and symmetry in a calculative manner where one's primary motivation for ethical action is based on the calculation that you will treat me in the same manner. Now, it certainly appears that Levinas is calling into question this entire way of thinking, which has characterized so much of modern thought. I do not think that this is what Levinas is really doing, although he is frequently read in this manner. He does have an appreciation of the tradition of moral autonomy and human dignity. Levinas is not abandoning or refuting this tradition. He is questioning it and seeking to show us what it presupposes. To read Levinas as simply reversing traditional binary oppositions, autonomy, heteronomy, symmetry, asymmetry, reciprocity, non-reciprocity, is to trivialize him. His logic is not a bivalent logic of either or, but a bivalent logic of both and, and that's what makes him such an interesting and difficult thinker. I read him as supplementing our moral tradition in the most extreme and radical manner of showing us why there is no morality, no autonomy, no freedom, or responsibility unless there is also heteronomy, asymmetry, and infinite responsibility for the other. But we must try to understand precisely what Levinas is challenging and why. Let me concentrate on what is a cardinal principle of the moral tradition that I have been adumbrating autonomy. When Kant sharply distinguishes autonomy from heteronomy, he is singling out what he takes to be the absolute condition for morality, that we are beings who are capable of self-legislation. This is what constitutes our freedom. Heteronomy is rejected by Kant because for him it is a limitation on our freedom. It means that we are dependent on something other than our own practical reason as a ground for morality. But this is precisely what Levinas wants to assert. Our very subjectivity, autonomy, and freedom are dependent on the other, the other for which I have an infinite responsibility. 
It is not that Kant fails to recognize that we have obligations to other human beings, but rather he claims that we have these obligations by virtue of the fact that these others are rational self-legislating agents. They, like us, are ends in themselves. They are essentially the same as we are. And this is where Levinas protests and provokes. Because this illustrates what Levinas means by the tendency to reduce or to assimilate the other to the same. As moral agents, as self-legislating beings, we are all the same. We must be, according to Kant. Levinas is not saying flatly that Kant is wrong, even that he wants to abandon the truth implicit in the Kantian understanding of freedom and self-legislation, but rather that this freedom itself presupposes a more primordial responsibility for the otherness of the other, that there is a responsibility thrust upon us willy-nilly before we can even speak of our freedom. Furthermore, this responsibility is not reciprocal in the sense that it is based on the expectation that others that we encounter will also treat us in a responsible manner. We stand in an asymmetri asymmetrical relation to the other. Levinas does not flinch from the extreme demand that this places upon us. For ethically, I am responsible for the other regardless of whether or not the other responds or reciprocates my gestures toward him. But let us not forget that Levinas is describing the ethical relation of every person and every other human being. Each of us stands in an asymmetrical, non-reciprocal relation to the singular other. I began by saying that Levinas is a difficult thinker. But the difficulty is not just a matter of trying to understand what he's saying. That's only part of it. It is a difficulty of facing the profound challenge that he presents to our ways of thinking and acting. The difficulty of listening and responding to the prophetic summons that we can hear in his writings. The difficulty of trying to lead an ethical life. Ethical freedom is in difficile liberté, a heteronomous freedom obliged to the other. We may think that this ethical demand is too great and too utopian, that Levinas's understanding of an ethical relation is an ethics for saints, not human beings. But Levinas himself speaks of this as the great objection to his thought. But listen to his reply when this was raised in the dialogue with uh, Richard Kearney. He says, raising the question, where did you ever see an ethical relation practice, people say to me? I reply that it's being utopian does not prevent from investing our everyday actions of generosity or goodwill towards the other. Even in the smallest and the most commonplace gestures, such as saying after you as we sit at the dinner table or walk through the door, bear witness to the ethical. This concern for the other remains utopian in the sense that it is always out of place, utopos, the literal meaning of utopia in this world, always other than the ways of the world. But there are many examples of it in the world. That's Levinas. I suggested earlier that the dedication of otherwise than being or beyond essence might serve as an epigraph for all of Levinas's thinking and writing from the time of the Shoah. If we interpret his thinking and writings as a testimony, in the way in which testimony was spoken so beautifully this morning by, by Tina, and a response to what he would 
the unspeakable horrors of the 20th century. Then it takes on, I suggest, a poignancy, a clarity, a directness that has rarely been equaled. How different everything might have been today if the perpetuators and the bystanders of the murder of millions had seen in the defenseless eyes of their victims the singularity of the other. If they had been responsive to their responsibility not to let the other die alone. If they had heard the summons in the face to face not to kill. Sometimes a single example, a single example can epitomize what one is saying in ever so many ways that might be inadequate. And in particular, I think what Levinas means by an ethical response. In listening and responding to Levinas, I think of a story that he might have cited to illustrate what he means by acting ethically. At one point in her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, her controversial book, this is something that not, not many people discuss as part of it, almost as a moment of relief and counterpoint to her unrelenting bleak portrait of Eichmann, Hannah Arendt reports the story of a German sergeant, Anton Schmidt, Schmidt was in charge of a patrol in Poland that collected stray German soldiers who were cut off from their units. In the course of carrying out his duties, Schmidt met members of the Polish Jewish underground and helped them by supplying forged papers and military trucks. This went on for five months from October 1941 until March 1942, when Anton Schmidt was arrested and executed by the German authorities. The following is Arendt's comment on what happened in the Jerusalem courtroom when this simple story was told by Kovner, a member of the Jewish underground who had encountered Anton Schmidt. This is what Hannah Arendt writes. During the few minutes it took Kovner to tell of the help that had come from a German sergeant, a hush settled over the courtroom. It was though the crowd spontaneously decided to observe the usual two minutes of silence in honor of the man named Anton Schmidt. And in those two minutes, which were like a sudden burst of light in the midst of impenetrable, unfathomable darkness, a single thought stood out clearly, irrefutably, beyond question. How utterly different everything would be today in this courtroom, in Israel, in Germany, in all of Europe, and perhaps in all countries of the world, if only more such stories could have been told. It's Hannah Arendt. We know little more about Anton Schmidt than is revealed in this story. But Levinas might have told it as the story of someone who looked into the defenseless eyes of the face of the other, who heard the summons not to kill, who was willing to risk his life out of concern for other human beings. The story of somebody who could break through the stereotypes and murderous hatred that blinded so many from ethically responding to the singularity and the otherness of the other. How different the world would be yesterday, today, and tomorrow if only there were more such stories to tell. Ethics, Levinas tells us, is always out of place, utopos in this world, always other than the ways of the world but there are many examples of it in the world. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Bernstein. Um, though we're almost out of time, I thought I think there's time for a, a brief question or two. Um, the first one that uh, that occurred in the in the context of the last piece of your talk, Professor Bernstein, is the question that that uh, relates to how we're to respond to people who are coming to us from the uh, the the tradition, the Kantian tradition, for example, that you spoke of. Is it to be our response to these folks who, who talk about autonomy and freedom that there's a sense in which we should give up the notion of autonomy and freedom, or are we to somehow hold it in balance with the kind of view that you, you present to us from Levinas's perspective? Is it a question of giving up or somehow holding the two in tension? Well, I mean, you know, I'm a a little bit humble with all these Levinasian scholars, but nevertheless, I'll tell you what I really think. You know, I, I think uh, it's not giving it up at all. I mean, uh, I do object, as I said in the lecture, to what I think is becoming a very facile reading of Levinas, which is simply to reverse the polarities of the tradition, you know, heteronomy, and, and indeed his rhetoric you know, invites that. Um, I think it's a rhetoric to shock us and to make us think. I do not see at all that um, he is, I mean, you know, one of the things that seems to me about, so wonderful about Levinas is he's a generous thinker. He's a sharply critical thinker, but a generous thinker. And I think he recognizes the tradition. And that's why I said at one time that it is the distinctive nuance of the both and that we have to recognize, of course we are autonomous and free, but it's not in the negative sense in which Kant was worried about heronomy, a false authority, a false reliance. But there is another sense, a positive sense of heteronomy, which I think becomes important for his uh, freedom. And indeed, uh, I think this was suggested uh, both by Diane and by Tina this, mo uh, this morning, I think that sometimes people underplay uh, what becomes, I think, increasingly clear in otherwise and being the deep appreciation uh, that Levinas begins to have for what it calls justice and equality for the political. Uh, I mean, what he's making is a striking claim that what we normally call morality could only exist presupposes what he calls ethics. So I do not see this as an either or. I do not think this is giving it up. I think that that makes him less interesting and less difficult and less provoking. At the beginning of your talk, you talked about the, uh, the reversal, in a sense, of the tradition in which um, ethics becomes first yeah. philosophy. Um, uh, one of the philosophers, no doubt, in our audience uh, asked the question, if ethics is first philosophy, what comes next? How are we to look at projects like philosophy of science, um, in, uh, investigations into knowledge, and so on, uh, in light of, of this reversal? Yeah. I've, it would be a slight variation of an answer to my first uh, mm -hmm. question. I mean, it is not the case. I mean, Levinas doesn't do everything. And he's certainly not interested in all the traditional subjects that we deal with in philosophy or traditional disciplines. But the outlines of the answer, I think, are perfectly clear. Uh, if I am right, there is a reciprocal relationship between infinity and totality, totality and infinity, or putting it in his language, between metaphysics as first philosophy and ontology. They cannot be one without the other. And I think that Levinas sees that. And in this sense, it seems to me that there isn't, I mean, uh, the idea I don't see that he would rule out anything that we do in philosophy. He would be reminding us of what is, what it presupposes. I mean, the drive for him, I think, is always, what is it that is really sort of presupposed? And doing this in a way which does not fall into the normal pattern of a transcendental question of possibility. Thank so, you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we've come to the end of our, of our program. I'd like you to join me in thanking Professor Bernstein. For the benefit of our television audience, our next telecast will be Professor Deborah Lipstad's keynote address this evening at 8 o'clock. The title of her presentation is Imagining the End, American Jewry, 1945-1945. to 1945.
and the memory of the Holocaust, 1945 to 1995. Thank you.